December 21st, 1930. I sit in front of the fire thinking, why even bother? I haven't written in this journal for many weeks. Just haven't felt like it. Since the happenings in the Louisiana swamp, things haven't been the same. For those amongst you who want to know what happened after, after everybody started shooting, Inspector Legrasse and his men were able to capture all of the cult members. The murders in Louisiana have stopped. Sherm, even with all his medical skill, was unable to save any of the cult's victims. Most of the cult members were put on trial and sentenced to death. Several of them were found to be criminally insane and have been locked up. The one that appears to be the leader of the cult, an old woman named Castro, Sherman had transferred to the Arkham Asylum. Inspector Legrasse, not wanting to spend public money, had no problem with her being transferred here. It's almost Christmas, but it seems so far away. I don't think I'll ever be happy again. March 1st, 1931. Audio Journal of Sherman Bear. Patient file number 1397. Patient name, Castro. Female, age unknown. Patient was a member of the Cthulhu cult. I have been called by the nursing staff to talk to her, since for the last several hours she has been very upset. Hello, Doctor. I've heard that you have been screaming at the nurses. What is the matter? Why do you keep us locked up? It wasn't us that killed. It was the black winged ones. Oh, but that doesn't matter. I can feel it. He stirs. He's awakening. Who is awakening? They all lay in stone houses in their great city of Raleigh. Preserved by spells of mighty Cthulhu. For glorious resurrection when the stars and earth are ready for them. Please calm down. Doctor, do you want to know a secret? Okay. The secret is the stars have come around to their right position in the cycle of eternity. And he stirs. And he calls us. Who stirs? Cthulhu stirs. Cthulhu! Cthulhu stirs! And he calls us all down! All down! All down! All down! Mary, I need some help in here. Doctor, come quick! Something's happening! <laughs> March 1st, 1931. Sherman came home late from work today in a real foul mood. I tried to ask him what was wrong, and he just growled at me, so I went and hid. He came and found me later and said he was sorry for being moody, and said he was going to cook supper to make up for it. It looks like he's indulging in one of his favorite hobbies, French cuisine. I can't wait because he says he's going to make a deep southern favorite with a French twist. He calls it Poulet Faire Fille. Alouette, gentille alouette, alouette, gentille plumeau, gentille plumeau, la tête. Brownie, can you get that? Huh? Can you get the door? Why do I want the door? No, answer the door. What does it want to know? No, someone is at the door. Oh, I'll get it. Uh oh, it's Daddy Sherm. Why is it he always shows up when I'm cooking? I'll get the air freshener. Hold on, just a second. I'll hide it in the oven. Just one more second. It's all good, Brownie. Oh, hey, Danny. Sure, come on, he's in the kitchen. Sherm, Danny's here. You don't look that good, Danny. Can I get you something to drink? I'll be right back. Take a seat. Hello, Danny. I am sorry to hear that. Here's your water, Danny. What happened to Wilcox? 
He has been stricken with an obscure sort of fever and has fallen into a slumber from which he cannot wake. And you need Sherm to come over right away to check him out. Let me just grab my medical bag and we'll go. Right behind you. Sherman Bear's audio log continues. Brownie and I have taken over our motor carriage to Danny's home. It is apparent when we arrive that the mood of the home is one of utter despair. We find Danny's brood gathered in the parlor. The absence of Wilcox is very apparent. We find Wilcox in his room with Danny's wife, who is keeping watch over their oldest son. Hello, Mildred. If it is okay with you, Danny, I'll examine your son now. Mm. Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. His pulse is steady, and his breathing is shallow but strong. It appears his temperature is normal. Very strange. Has anything happened that I should know? He has been having nightmares lately. He has been dreaming of a cyclopean vista of dark and dripping stone, with a subterranean voice or intelligence shouting monotonously in enigmatic sense impacts only describable as gibberish. Talk about droning and gibberish. But the most terrifying thing of all is he dreams of a gigantic thing miles high, which walks and lumbers about, and is coming for him? I'll take it from there, Sherm. And he's been so obsessed with it, that all he's been doing in his spare time is making drawings of the city and the mile-high creature that is lumbering about? Let me see the drawings. You over here on this table? Look, Sherm, it's a drawing of a squid bat. Brownie, he said the creature was a mile high. Oh, so once again we're talking about a big squid bat. Oh, you don't mean... Wilcox is saying something. What is it? I might have been able to understand if you had not been speaking. Keep going through all the pictures, and I will examine Wilcox. So you think the fever might be venereal? No. I meant I will examine Danny's son, Wilcox. Oh. Dear God. Sure, calm down. What is it? You had better listen to this for yourself, Brownie. Did I hear him correctly? I don't know. What do you think he said? I think he said, my boots are glue, and he'll have to pay. No, Brownie. Really listen. He's got awful quiet again. Must be in a deeper sleep. Just wait. He's awfully twitchy. Brownie. Yes, Brownie, that is what he is saying, and I think I have to tell you about what happened at the sanitarium today. March 2nd, 1931, from the Journal of Brown Monkey. It appears that Sherman and I have stumbled like sleepwalkers into a nightmare of unfathomable depths and are now trapped. Our dear friend Danny's oldest son, has been stricken by some unnatural affliction. He lies in an unwaking slumber. Shroom says he's physically fine, but he too is trapped in a nightmare. He seems to be dreaming of an ancient city called Rael, which is rising from the depths of the Earth's darkest water. And as the city rises, it appears that a dweller in the city stirs from his death-like sleep. His name is Cthulhu, and as he wakes, he calls the mad and the artistic to him, body and soul. And if that wasn't terrifying enough, 
it appears that Cthulhu is a really, really big squid bat. I am a man of science, Brownie. And just what does your heart tell you, Sherm? That something really bad is coming, and that you and I were unfortunate and saw just a little of it when we were in New Orleans. And now, all sorts of people are beginning to feel this arrival, and it's driving them mad or hurting them in ways that we have not even begun to imagine. Yeah, so, what do you want to do? What can we do, Brownie? We can stop him! Stop who? This Cthulhu! What? We can stop him! How? We don't even know where he is. Hold on! I found this in Wilcox drawings. Lines? Numbers? The lines must be longitude and latitude. And this big X with the skull and crossbones appears to be at roughly 49 degrees 15 minutes west and 128 degrees 35 minutes east. So we know where he is. So? So we go and stop him. He's hurting Wilcox, which is hurting Danny. And you saw what his followers did in New Orleans. And it was you who said we had to help to stop him. So let me understand, Brown. You want to take all of our savings, hire a ship, trust in this map that is drawn by a child in a coma, sail to the middle of nowhere, and when we get there, and if we find a city rising from the depths of the ocean, find a way of somehow stopping a mile-high ancient creature from hurting people that we love. Well, I don't have a better one, Sherm, and we have to do something. Because I'm never, ever letting what happened in New Orleans happen again. Brownie. Sherm. All right. I'll go pack my bags. 